The audio you're about to hear was recorded in Anchor. Learn more at anchor.fm. From sciencesortof.com, you're listening to Science Sort Of. Hello and welcome to Science Sort Of. This is episode 326. Our theme this week is Anchors Away Part 3. That's right, Part 3 of me featuring some of the shorter clips I did while I was producing a show for the podcast Startup Anchor, which has um, been doing very well. And uh, I'm still proud of the content that I made, but the model that they had at the time meant that the content kind of disappeared after 24 hours, but I got to keep it. I still have all the files. I own the, I own it. Um, so for me, it's, it's fun to feature. Uh, somebody wrote in after the last version of this episode, 282, I believe, to point out that I was spelling away wrong. I'm spelling it away as in to go away. And it turns out, I I did not know this, I learned something. The term actually is a naval nautical term, no great shock here, uh, for the anchor coming up off of the top of the the sea surface or the seabed, I guess, the seafloor. So when the phrase anchors away was used, it meant that the anchor had been lifted up enough that the vessel could now be underway. So you also have the phrase way anchor, which is to bring the anchor aboard the vessel preparing for departure. So that's where that comes from. I didn't know that. I'm going to keep the spelling on these episodes consistent, also in part because I started putting these episodes out when I moved away from doing my anchor show. So I still think it kind of works even as a unintended pun, I'll say. I'm not going to spend too much time getting into things here at the beginning and the end because it is hot and I I'm I turn off my AC and dehumidifier and fans and all the stuff that's keeping keeping my apartment comfortable when I record these things so the sound quality is good. Uh, Julie's outside with the dog right now so I had a few minutes to to lay down some tape and give you guys an intro. Um, you'll hear in these series of clips that I started sort of making my content for Anchor a little bit more thematic day to day. So it starts off with um, sort of a random segment that I had an idea to do based on some travel that travel, this thing we used to do where we would go other places. And then uh, it was March 15th. So if you remember the previous end of the Anchor's Way episode, I was talking about Pi a lot, and that's because it was Pi Day, March 14th, 3.14. Um, so for Ides of March, uh, a couple of the other hosts of some of the other shows in the kind of burgeoning Anchor podcast community thought it would be funny to talk about blood all day because Caesar got stabbed a bunch of times on the Ides of March. And so that's what I did. I did some blood science in various ways. And and then um, St. Patrick's Day was soon after that. So I did a bunch of like sort of Irish themed <laughs> content um, talking about Irish snakes and the science behind brewer's yeast and some fun stuff that way. So you'll see that I, I tried to get a little bit more experimental. I tried to play around with things a little bit more. Uh, I had a lot of fun with it. I think I, I produced some really interesting content and based on uh, where things are going in the world, my own ambitions, it's not entirely impossible that uh, this this show, that Organized Curiosity might make a comeback. If that's something you'd be interested in, please do let me know. If you let me know, you'll be featured in the segment that I'm going to come back at the end for, which is the Paleo Pow. Should I tell you what I'm drinking now or should I save it? I'll tell you now. I'll tell you now. Okay. I have a can of beer from Jackie O's, which is a brewery in Athens, Ohio. And this is one of those breweries that a buddy of mine uh, from Santa Cruz, who was from the Midwest originally, talked about this brewery all the time as like one of his mecca breweries. Like he's like, I got to get to Jackie O's at some point. And now they're doing well enough that they're canning and distributing. And this is their Mystic Mama Dry Hopped India Pale Ale west coast style ipa i know everyone's probably tired of hearing me gripe about the east coast styles so this is a west coast style and um, i love a west coast style ipa especially on these hot dog days of summer Mmm, boy tastes good i don't know it's beer i like beer um i'm making dinner the thing i'm making is turning out a little too spicy so this beer is going down (laughs) quite nicely Uh, i'm gonna line up some clips for y'all and then i'll be back at the end of the clips for a paleo pal.
Welcome to Organized Curiosity, the anchor science station dedicated to cataloging everything we know about the natural world for your edutainment. I'm your host, Ryan Haupt, and it's time for the segment, Science App Recommendation Engine. I, I, I don't have a name for this segment yet. I was traveling yesterday, and of late, I've realized that when I have the window seat, I tend to keep the shade drawn because I spend most of the flight staring at a screen. Yesterday, though, I was in a geological mood, as you do, and so I pulled the shade down and watched the west of America fly by. As a paleontologist, I've taken my fair share of geology courses, but because geology is all around us, most of my courses focused on specific areas of the U.S. I already happen to be in. So if you want to talk to me about the geological history of the area just to the east of Yosemite and just to the north of Death Valley, I could give you a pretty convincing lecture and maybe even draw a crude map. Just about anywhere else, I'm as lost as the next person. But when you're staring out the window of a plane, there's so much cool stuff to see. Shane Leffler, at the time a geology student at the University of Minnesota, had the same thought while flying over Canada, but instead of just wondering quietly in ignorance, he applied for an NSF grant to make an app. It's called Flyover Country, and it's pretty freaking great, so here's a free plug. It's available on iOS and Android, and the way it works is, prior to taking off, open the app, select the start and the endpoints of your flight on the map. The app will then give you a wide swath on either side of your route, and offer you four types of maps and data from four different databases, including Wikipedia, to download to your phone so you can learn while you're airborne. See a particularly weird looking mountain? You can pull up more info and learn about the rock types, when it formed, how it formed, if any fossils have been found there, so forth and so on. It's a pretty simple way to learn a lot about the US when you'd normally be playing Angry Birds. You can learn more and find the download links for the app at fc.umn.edu. If you've already used the app, call in and tell me something cool you learned, and if you haven't, get on it and then get back to me with how you liked it. Remember, this was an NSF-supported project, meaning if you're a U.S. taxpayer, you've already paid for this app, so there's no reason not to use it. And that'll do for my app plug. Thank you for listening. Please call in if you have any questions or your own cool science app you want to tell me about, and remember to favorite this station if you want to learn more cool stuff about the natural world every single day. Until next time, stay curious out there. There's a lot to learn. Welcome to Organized Curiosity, the anchor science station dedicated to cataloging everything we know about the natural world for your edutainment. I'm your host, Ryan Haupt, and it's the Ides of March, the day we celebrate? Celebrate can't be the right word. Remember? Eh. Acknowledge? Yeah, I like acknowledge. Today's the day we acknowledge that in 44 BC, Julius Caesar was stabbed to death by a bunch of his friends. So I thought today would be a fun day to dedicate to blood. And for the most part in this segment, I'm only talking about humans because evolution is a tricky mistress. Blood is a body fluid we and many other animals rely on to transport nutrients, oxygen, and metabolic waste to and from our cells. The blood in your body is about 7% of your total weight. You should be carrying around 5 liters or so, which is about 1.3 gallons of the stuff at any given moment. About 55% of blood is plasma, which is a straw-colored fluid that is mostly water. The pH of your blood should be between 7.35 to 7.45, meaning blood is slightly more basic than pure water, which is exactly 7. Your body works hard to keep the pH in the right range because the consequences of becoming too acidic or too basic are really bad news. Your blood also contains cells. The three main kinds are erythrocytes, which are red blood cells, leukocytes, which are white blood cells, and thrombocytes, which are the platelets. Red blood cells are anuclear, meaning they lack a nucleus, and contain hemoglobin, a protein containing iron, which allows these cells to bind to oxygen molecules and distribute oxygen throughout your body. Your red blood cells last for 100 to 120 days before being recycled by macrophages, which are cells that eat other cells. It takes about one minute for a red blood cell pump from the heart to make it back to the heart, so your blood moves at a pretty zippy pace. Red blood cells account for about 25% of all the cells in a human body. When oxygenated, red blood cells are bright red, hence the color of fresh blood, and when not bonded to oxygen, they're a darker red, sometimes appearing blue in the veins beneath your skin. The reversible bonding to oxygen makes sense because it has to be able to release the oxygen once it reaches the cell that needs it. Fetuses have a special type of hemoglobin cleverly called fetal hemoglobin, which is stronger than adult hemoglobin in its bonding, allowing the fetus's red blood cells to rip the oxygen off of mom's hemoglobin as it passes past each other in the placenta. One kind of crummy thing about hemoglobin is that it bonds to carbon monoxide much more strongly than it does to an oxygen molecule. This is what makes carbon monoxide poisoning so terrible. 
the carbon monoxide hogs up your hemoglobin binding sites, making it impossible for your cells to get the oxygen they need to function, resulting in death. Anemias are diseases of the red blood cells that diminish their ability to transport oxygen, which you may have heard of in the case of an iron deficiency anemia, but I actually want to talk about sickle cell anemia. Sickle cell anemia is caused by a genetic mutation that results in an abnormally shaped hemoglobin and an overall misshapen red blood cell. It can lead to some pretty bad outcomes, especially if you carry two copies of the mutated gene instead of just one. The cool thing is that this mutation seems to have persisted in certain parts of the world because it helps protect the carrier against malaria. So it's an example of human evolution in action. White blood cells are part of your immune system. This is why a doctor might look at a patient's white blood cell count, because if your body is fighting an infection, you'll see higher number of these cells in the blood. When you're a healthy adult, these cells are about 1% of your blood volume. There are different kinds of white blood cells, each specifically adapted to different kinds of pathogens and can be produced as needed needed for various infections. One way white blood cells know what cells to attack are based on surface proteins on the intruding cell, and your body can produce the right type of white blood cell once it's learned what surface proteins it needs to go after. This is in part how vaccines work. We introduce a dead form of a disease that can't actually infect you, but still has the surface proteins to trigger an immune response. Once your body has responded, it produces the right type of white blood cells to fight the real infection if you're ever exposed to it. These memory cells don't last forever, which is why sometimes you have to get a booster. This is also the type of cell that the human immunodeficiency virus, or HIV, attacks and compromises, which is what has made it such a tough disease to fight. It's disrupting the very system in place to protect you from this sort of disruption. Last up are platelets, which are there to help you coagulate or stop bleeding by literally clogging the side of the leak. So if you have a small cut, these cells rush to the scene, start sticking to the sides of the cut, and eventually pile up with each other and literally form bridges of cells across the cut to stop the bleeding as quickly as possible. This is part of your body's coagulation cascade, which is followed up by other processes to heal the wound once bleeding has stopped. Unfortunately, Caesar was stabbed 23 times, so I doubt his platelets stood much of a chance. There are three broad disorders concerning platelets, not enough, not working, and too many, which can all be brought about by genetics, disease, or drugs. Did I miss anything? Do you have a cool blood disorder you want to tell us about? Then call in and let us know and make sure you favorite this station for more blood coming up later today. Until next time, stay curious out there. There's a lot to learn. I'm back. I'm curious. I'm trying to get organized. So let's get into this segment, which is Better Know a Root, where we demystify some fancy science words so you'll never be confused by it again. Today's root is hema, which is Greek for blood. You may see it used as hema, hyma, hemo, but they're all referring to blood. There are lots of examples, both medical and scientific, to talk about here. Hemoglobin is a biomolecule in red blood cells and literally means blood ball. Ugh, gross. Hemophilia, that disease that incesty royals used to get more often than they would if they'd mixed up the breeding every few generations, means blood love, which is weird because it makes you bleed more than normal people. If you're bleeding all the time, does that mean you just love your blood more? It seems kind of like the opposite. There's also hemorrhage, which is usually pronounced hemorrhage, but I'm trying to emphasize the hemoness of it all for you, which is an excessive amount of bleeding. A different blood disorder is hemochromatosis, which is an overload of iron in the blood, and one of the simplest treatments for it is bloodletting, which you probably thought nobody did anymore, but don't you worry, phlebotomy is alive and well. I know because I'm actually at risk for this one, but don't worry, I've been tested and I'm fine. A hemorrhoid is a swelling of the blood vessels, and now I'm wondering why I decided to do this, because it's all really gross. Oh wait, one more. Hemophage is an animal that eats blood. So like mosquitoes, leeches, and chupacabras. Can I be, can I be done with this one? It's really gotten my blood up. All right, that'll do for Better Know a Root this time. If you have your own root you're excited about or a question about something you've heard here, call into this station and let us know. Make sure you favorite this station as well for more blood content today and more science content tomorrow. Until next time, stay curious out there because there's a lot to learn.
We're rounding out Ides of March Blood Day with a bio bio celebrating a round animal, the wonderful Atlantic horseshoe crab, Limulus polyphemus. Wondering what this one has to do with our blood theme for the day? Well, stay tuned. Just so we're clear, the genus Limulus is one of three living genera within the Limulidae. All animals within this family are commonly called horseshoe crabs, so just remember that I'm talking specifically about the one found off the east coast of North America from Maine south to the Yucatan Peninsula and all throughout the Gulf of Mexico too. Horseshoe crabs are often called living fossils. As a paleontologist, I'm here to tell you that that's a dumb term that leads to all sorts of misconceptions. What is meant by the term is that we have fossils from up to 400 million years ago that look superficially similar to modern horseshoe crabs. So people say that they haven't been evolving. Here's the thing. Evolution can work by maintaining a steady course. Think of it like those new cars that alert you when you're drifting outside of your lane. If the lane you're in is working, it might be detrimental or just plain not worth it to try new things that may not work. So you keep on the straight and narrow. And that's just what we have here with these guys. Horseshoe crabs are not horseshoes and they're not crabs. The second one was probably a bit more surprising than the first. You might have heard that they're arachnids, which is also not true, but it's getting closer to the mark. They're actually in their own order called Ziphosura, which means sword tail in Greek, and which is in the larger group, Chelicerata, which also contains arachnids. They're also thought to be one of the closest living relatives to the extinct group Trilobites. Their body is made up of three main parts, the prosoma, epithosoma, and telson. The prosoma is the head region, the epithosoma is the abdominal region, and the telson is the wicked-looking spine-like tail. Their body is covered in a large carapace or shell, which is shaped like, you guessed it, a horseshoe, and it can be greenish-gray to dark brown. The carapace being this kind of large, smooth surface tends to pick up hitchhikers like algae, barnacles, mollusks, etc. Horseshoe crabs breathe using book gills, which are similar to the book lungs used by spiders, but not quite the same thing, and the evolutionary relationship between the two is not fully understood. They have a compound eye on either side of the head region, five more eyes on the carapace, and two eyes underneath the carapace by their mouth. That's nine eyes total, plus some light-sensing organs along the tail. Females are 25 to 30% larger than males and can grow up to about two feet long if you include the tail. They like to live on the bottom of muddy and sandy bays and estuaries and lay their eggs along the gentle sandy slope right near the coast which seem pretty common if you've done a lot of beach holidaying in the Atlantic coast or Gulf of Mexico. They're most active at night, especially when the moon is full, so I guess they can use all their eyes, and they dig for food like worms, algae, and mollusks. In spring and summer, they have these huge migrations where they congregate and mate near the shore. Females lay 2,000 to 20,000 eggs at a time, you know, just in case. Juveniles, called larvae, hatch after about five weeks but stay buried under the sand until the right high tide comes along when they emerge and swim around like crazy. After a week of hectic swimming, they molt, look more like adults, settle to the floor, and start living their life. Sexual maturity takes 9 to 11 years for males and 10 to 12 years for females. It's hard to know how long they live in the wild, but it could be up to 20 to 40 years. Horseshoe crabs are an important player in their ecosystem, providing food for birds, turtles, alligators, and fish. Plus, the way they feed keeps the bottom sediment well aerated, allowing more species to live there. Like so many marine species, the horseshoe crab is threatened by pollution and overfishing. And in most cases, we're not even fishing them for good reason. We don't eat them, but we like to eat what they eat. So a lot of fishing is just to make sure we have enough clams in the market, which... I think is pretty dumb, and I even like clams as a food. It's also dumb because horseshoe crabs fulfill an important role not just in their ecosystem, but in pharmaceutical safety testing. Oh yeah, we're getting into the blood stuff. Instead of hemoglobin, which vertebrates possess and makes our blood nice and red, a lot of invertebrates use a protein called hemocyanin, which contains copper instead of iron, making it blue-green instead of red, like an old penny or Spock. Horseshoe crab blood in particular is really good at clotting whenever it senses toxins released from bacteria. This property is called limulus amoebocyte lysate, or LAL, and is used to test drugs and other substances for bacterial contamination. So every year, tens of thousands of horseshoe crabs are collected, pricked and drained of about a third of their blood, and then released back into the wild. I love this because it's like a real alien abduction story, yanked out of the water, subjected to weird medical treatments, and put back to try to convince your buddies that you weren't just drunk the whole time. We couldn't produce LAL without them, so the next time you see a horseshoe crab, be sure to say thanks. And that'll do for our Ides of March Blood Celebration Day here on Organized Curiosity. Thanks again for listening. Hope you got something out of this and didn't lose any blood in the process. If you have your own species you're excited about because it's got weird blood or something, please let me know. And make sure to favorite this station if you want more content like this tomorrow, but probably a little less bloody. Until next time, stay curious out there. There's a lot to learn.
Welcome to Organized Curiosity, the anchor science station dedicated to cataloging everything about the natural world for your edutainment. We're going to take a little bit of a blood break, then get back to the blood. So don't worry, more blood to come. But right now I want to do a bio bio for the mangrove finch, Camarynchus heliobates, one of the world's rarest birds, partly because it's super endangered. More on that in a moment. This is one of Darwin's finches, which means, as you might have guessed, it's found on the Galapagos Islands, an archipelago of volcanic islands right on the equator in the Pacific Ocean off the coast of Ecuador. Famed naturalist Charles Darwin arrived at the Galapagos on September 15, 1853, when he was traveling as the captain's dining companion, which is not as untoward as it sounds, aboard the HMS Beagle. While on the islands, he made observations about the geology and biology he saw, including about 15 species of finches within the tanager family Thraupidae. The significance of the finches is that even though they were all closely related and probably arrived on the islands from the mainland as a small founding group, they all had diverged into different forms, and Darwin was able to observe this divergence, particularly from their beaks. When they arrived on the islands, there were all these habitats and food resources or niches that weren't being exploited by any other animal, so the finches filled in the gaps in what's known as adaptive radiation. This helped Darwin begin to understand the process by which species evolve, eventually leading him to formulate, cue booming voice, the theory of evolution by means of natural selection. In the mangrove finch, the beak is long and pointed with a down-curved coolman. The coolman is a ridge on the upper beak from the tip of the bill going up to the forehead. This particular beak is evolved to pick scales of bark off of trees so the bird can find and eat insects. If they're having trouble finding food, they have been known to use cactus spines and twigs to pry grubs out of tree hollows and cavities. Yeah, we're talking about tool use, not just for chimps anymore. Their plumage is dull brown on top, fading to olive towards the tail. The underparts are whitish. Males have some black coloration on the head and neck that develops over the course of several annual molts. This is a pretty tiny bird. It's only about 14 centimeters long and 18 grams in weight. The mangrove finch is endemic to two islands, meaning it first evolved there. The bird is extinct on the island of Fernandina and barely hanging on on the island of Isabella. Historically, they were known to occupy at least six mangrove patches, but are now down to just two. So let's talk about this habitat for a minute. Mangroves are super specialized habitats for lots and lots of organisms, including the mangroves themselves. Mangrove swamps exist at the margins of the land and the sea. Mangrove trees are specially adapted to live at this interface, including special adaptations for saltwater tolerance. Mangrove root structures help keep water calm, so much so that on many islands, mangrove swamps are used as refugia for boats during intense tropical storms. Many fish use mangrove swamps as mating and spawning areas because the roots provide ample hiding spots for vulnerable young fishies. As climate change reduces ice cover and raises sea level, mangroves are in a particularly bad spot. Even slight increases in sea level have the potential to really damage mangrove habitats and cascade onto every organism that relies on mangroves for part of their life cycle. Getting back to the bird, the mangrove finch breeds during the wet season from December through May. They're typically monogamous, forming lifelong breeding pairs, but sometimes they'll mix up mates or sneak around and mate with more than one partner. Females lay three eggs, which are incubated for 12 days. Then the chick hatches, hangs out for two weeks, and then leaves the nest. Ready for the sad part? This birdo is critically endangered with a population of less than 100 adult birds. 100. And a breeding range of one square kilometer. The root cause of this decline remains unknown. It's possible that changes to El Nino cycles and human activity are all contributing. Humans also bring rats, cats, a type of blood-sucking nest parasite called the Falornis downsi, which kills nestlings, and the Ani, which is a type of cuckoo bird, which if you didn't know, are parasitic d All this results in an overall crummy reproductive success rate for the mangrove finch. So there's less than 100 of these birds, and we don't even know why they're declining. Captive breeding and translocation programs are being attempted, but it's not a good outlook for this bird, which is a shame. When so many Americans don't believe in evolution and climate change, the loss of a finch Darwin himself held and revered just kind of breaks my heart. Sorry to end on a downer, but we've just got to get our together. So that'll do for this installment of BioBios. I'm actually kind of looking forward to getting back to blood here in a moment. So stay tuned to this station for more great science content. Be sure to favorite it so you don't miss anything. And remember to stay curious out there. There's a lot to learn.
let me Google that. Just calling in to say I love your show, and I particularly loved this episode. Um, it feels kind of weird to call in and be like, I love blood, yas. Um, but I kind of do. <laughs> and I was super excited that you mentioned uh, persistent fetal hemoglobin because that is a topic that I always nut over and I really want to tackle it on my show at some point. So we should totally collab. Um, or like you can call in about that because it is a super fascinating topic. Um, I never know how to... I, I call in and I like never know how to end. Um, I don't know how to like transition out of this. Uh, I feel like I should give you a fun fact or something. Uh, my A... My my blood type is a um a plus, a plus a plus my blood type is a positive um a yeah my blood is so good it gets an a plus there you go that's your fun fact anyway thanks bye Plink, plonk. getting back to blood for a minute Abby from let me Google that called in and she's also super excited about persistent fetal hemoglobin because she's a right thinking person but she also mentioned her blood type and that was something I didn't mention at all yesterday so let's get curious. I'm trying out new catchphrases. This one was supposed to be like a Darkwing Duck vibe. Anyway, as a caveat, even though I do a lot of biology, I'm not this kind of biologist by a long shot. I'll always do my best to get the important information right, but, you know, be forewarned. Blood types or blood groups are a way of classifying human red blood cells based on antibodies in the blood and antigens on the red blood cells. Antibodies are cells in the blood plasma that are able to bind to a specific antigen, basically like if you weaponized puzzle pieces. Your body produces antibodies based on the threats it's recognized as foreign. So if you have blood type A, your body would see blood type B as a threat and form antibodies to attack B type cells. I'll explain this in a bit more detail in a moment. Antigens are molecules on the surface of a cell that can induce an immune response. These can be made of proteins, carbohydrates, glycoproteins, and glycolipids. Antigens on blood cells come in a few flavors or shapes, each of which corresponds to the blood types you've heard of. Blood types are denoted using an A, B, AB, and O system, with a plus or minus afterwards. Blood type A has one type of surface antigen, blood type B has a different type, and blood type O has none, so think of O as like a zero. An additional antigen called RHD for rhesus group D can be found on any of these letter combinations. If it's there, then you have a positive. If it's absent, then you're the negative. Your blood type is inherited from both parents. If you remember the basics of a Punnett square, which is that square where we figure out genetic combinations from two parents, the configuration should be pretty straightforward. You inherit one of three genes from each parent. If you inherit two A genes or one A gene and one O gene, you're type A, since A is dominant over O. The same goes for two Bs or a B and an O. A and B are co-dominant, so if you inherit one of each, you get AB blood. The only way to get O type blood is with two O's. It's important to match blood types in certain ways during transfusions because the wrong type of blood can elicit an immune response where the body receiving the blood sees the new blood as intruders and will attack and destroy it, which is not good. Mothers often carry fetuses that have a different blood type than their own, so why aren't the fetuses under attack? Because oxygen and nutrients pass through the placenta, mom and baby aren't actually sharing the same blood supply, so everyone just keeps to their respective corner. Except in the case where mom has negative blood and baby has positive blood, regardless of the letters. When this situation occurs, mom can form antibodies which would attack the fetal red blood cells with the positive antigen on them. Antibodies are really small, so sometimes they can sneak through the placenta and cause hemolysis, or literally a rupturing of fetal red blood cells. When it comes to blood transfusion for medical purposes, the best bet is always to get an exact match, but there are some other ways transfusion can work. Blood type O negative is called the universal donor because it lacks antigens for A and B, as well as the RHD antigen, which is why it's negative. There is nothing on the red blood cell that is going to trigger an immune response in the recipient. It's a blank slate and therefore not perceived as a threat. On the other side of the coin is AB positive, which is called the universal receiver. Because their red blood cells have every type of antigen on them, nothing you can introduce would be seen as new or foreign, so they can take whatever you got. If you're only A or only B, you can only get blood from other A's, B's, or O's. No mixing of A and B unless you're already A, B together. If you have the same letter groups, a negative can give to a positive, but not the other way around. Now, sometimes there's a reason to transfer just the plasma part of blood, not the red blood cells. And this has a compatibility component as well, but it's reversed. 
because the antibodies, which are the attackers, live in the plasma. So AB, which has no antibodies, can give to everyone, whereas O, which has all the antibodies, can receive from anyone. So it's just like red blood cells. It's just flipped. As with most of my segments, there's a lot more going on here than what I've been able to cover. So the next time you give blood for a good cause, be sure to ask all sorts of questions until you pass out or they give you a cookie to shut you up. So thanks for calling in, Abby. I really appreciated you giving me a chance to expound on some of the stuff I left off yesterday. Uh, Hopefully not too much more blood content for me. I can get back to the science that I prefer, which is, you know, cute, fluffy animals and stuff. But I'll talk about whatever you guys want to give me. So call in with whatever you're curious about, and I'll do my best to address it in a future segment. Be sure to favorite this station so you never miss a segment as they come out. And until next time, stay curious out there because there's a lot to learn. Welcome to Organized Curiosity. I'm your host, Ryan Haupt. And today, since it's St. Patrick's Day, let's ask the question, why are there no snakes in Ireland? According to legend, one of the things St. Patrick's did in his life in the 5th century AD was banish all of the snakes from Ireland, which is great if you're my mom because she is definitely not a fan. Here's the thing, though. Ireland has never had snakes, so your enjoyment of today is entirely based on lies. What's that? People... People don't enjoy St. Patrick's Day just because of snakes. Well, I don't know what else there is to celebrate about it. Anyway, on to the real reason there are no danger noodles on the Emerald Isle, geology. The story is surprisingly simple relative to the types of things I usually talk about on this station. Let's go back 10,000 years to the end of the last ice age when Earth was much colder than it is today and will be again for quite some time. Good job, humans. Most of Ireland was covered in ice, making it completely inhospitable to ectothermic or cold-blooded reptiles like snakes. As the ice retreated and temperatures climbed, snakes moved northward back into mainland Europe, even as far north as the Arctic Circle, because underground hibernation is a great strategy for ectotherms in climates with winter. But the ground has to be thawed enough for them to be able to burrow in the first place. Now, if you think about Earth's ocean as a single pool of water... If most of that water is frozen up in ice, the amount of liquid water is going to be less, which means overall lower sea levels and exposure of land bridges between places that aren't typically connected. This is exactly what happened between Ireland and Great Britain and between GB and mainland Europe. The land bridge persisted between Britain and Europe until about 6,500 years ago, giving snakes enough time to slither to England. But because of rising sea levels as the glaciers melted, Ireland was cut off from Britain 8,500 years ago, so 2,000 years earlier, while it was still too cold for snakes to make it all the way. Couldn't snakes have made a swim? The Irish Sea is about 50 miles across, and the water is pretty cold. While there are plenty of snakes that are fine swimmers, and snakes even specifically adapted to marine environments, those marine snakes are all found in warm tropical waters of the Pacific. This cold early cutoff doesn't just apply to snakes. Ireland to this day only has one native reptile, literally just called the common lizard. Snakes as a group have been around since the Cretaceous. The oldest fossil is a 94 million year old specimen from Israel, so there's some biblical irony for you on a saint's feast day. Does this mean that there could have been snakes on Ireland prior to the Ice Ages? Maybe. If there were, there's no evidence of it in the form of fossils. Granted, snakes don't preserve very well in the fossil record, and taphonomic or preservation bias is a topic we should probably cover at some point, but... To focus just on the snakes, according to Nigel Monaghan at the National Museum of Ireland in Dublin, no snake fossils have ever been found on the island. He has a pretty great quote I'll read, but I'm not going to do the accent. At no time has there ever been any suggestion of snakes in Ireland, so there was nothing for St. Patrick to banish which sums it up about as well as I could have. So let's leave it there. Thanks for listening to my station. Be sure to applaud segments that you like. Favorite the station so you don't miss any more content and echo it if you want people on your station to hear it. Until next time, stay curious. There's a lot to learn out there.
continuing with our St. Patrick's Day theme, have a sip of your favorite adult beverage because today's bio bio is for Saccharomyces cerevisiae, also known as brewer's or baker's yeast. This is going to be a tough one to squeeze into one segment because I am somewhat of a beer snob and now my friends are laughing because I had the audacity to say somewhat, but I'm going to do my best to hit the highlights and this might be a little bit more history of our relationship with yeast than the biology of the yeast itself, but I think the history is really, really fascinating and informs what we know about it scientifically at this point. Yeasts are a type of fungus, just like mushrooms and molds. Saccharomyces comes from Latinized Greek and is formed from two roots, saccharo, meaning sugar, in English we might call something saccharin if it's too sweet, and myces, which means mushroom fungus or mold. So it's literally sugar fungus, which is a pretty good name given what it likes to eat. If you've spent any time examining a bottle of Corona, you might also be able to guess that the species name Cerveisiae is Latin for of beer. It's hard to even know where to start talking about this little guy, so let's start at the beginning. Humans have had a long relationship with this fungus. I'd put it up there with dogs dogs and cows as one of the most important species we've ever domesticated. And yes, by most reasonable usages of the term domestication, brewer's yeast fits the bill. Does this mean that there are scary wolf-like yeast strands out still prowling in the wild? Oh yes, there are, but I don't think we're going to have time for them right now. So if your curiosity is piqued, call in and let me know and we'll deal with it another time. Bread, wine, and beer are some of the oldest agricultural products around, and all three require the metabolism of brewer's yeast to get to the finish line. These three products have also long held sacred and religious significance in many cultures, from the Dionysian cults of Greece believing that red wine was the blood of their god and to drink it was to be imbued with his spirit, to the sharing of bread with someone being considered a sign of true friendship, which is where we get the word companion, which literally mean with bread, compana, all the way up to the modern practice of Christian communion. The oldest recipe we've ever found, like ever, the oldest recipe we know that humans wrote down is a 4,000 year old recipe for beer, supposedly given to the Babylonians by the Sumerian god Enki, which he wrote as a tribute to Ninkasi, the goddess of alcohol. But up until very recently, it wasn't recognized that yeast was playing this really important role. The Reinheitsgebot, or Bavarian Purity Law, is often cited as saying beer can only contain four ingredients, water, hops, barley, and yeast. But when the law was first passed in 1516, it was only three ingredients, yeast wasn't on that list, simply because they didn't know it was a thing. I think this is where part of the divine significance of yeast comes from. From what I've read, back in the day, brewers would soak malted barley in hot or boiling water to help the grain release its sugars. This step isn't needed for wine because grapes already have plenty of available sugars. Hops would then be added for seasoning after a certain point in history. There's a lot of pre-hop beer recipes out there that are very, very different than what we would normally drink today. The mixture would be allowed to cool, then they'd wait hope and pray that the mixture fermented. Maybe they'd stir the mixture with a lucky or magic brewing stick, a stick that's often led to successful fermentation. But here's the thing, it wasn't magic, it was yeast. You can imagine that if you were a monk brewing all the time, you'd use the same equipment over and over again. Yeasts are pretty tough, so once the yeast has coated an item, provided you don't sterilize it with boiling water or something, they'd be able to hang out in stasis until coming in contact with sugar, at which point they'd wake up, start chowing down, and voila, beer. In the case of fruit-based alcohols, this might have been even simpler because a lot of times the waxy coating that you see on certain kinds of fruit actually contain brewer's yeast right there in the wax. So the act of crushing them up and homogenizing it all into a nice mixture would be enough to get the yeast exposed to the sugary pulp. Now, eventually humanity invented microscopes and were able to discover the microorganism that was responsible for so many fun nights and so many rough mornings. We learned that the yeast metabolism is all about eating sugar and excreting carbon dioxide and ethanol, which is the alcohol that is safe for humans to drink. So the sugar sweet barley mash becomes this boozy bubbly beer thanks to the yeast doing its own life cycle. If the yeast run out of sugar or produce too much alcohol to survive in, they shut down and sink to the bottom of the vat. Brewers can take the gunk that forms at the bottom of these vats and reuse some of it for the next batch, knowing that the yeast will wake back up and keep happily eating and producing. When I say that brewers yeasts are domesticated, what I mean is that we have selectively bred this species over thousands of years to produce mostly ethanol ethanol, and relatively few other metabolic waste products. Those other products can give beers different flavors and characteristics, which is why there are so many strains of brewer's yeast, but they're best done in small doses. Now, science has come a long way since beer recipes were given to us by the gods, and Saccharomyces cerevisiae is one of the most intensively studied organisms in the world. It's the go-to model organism for eukaryotic, so cells like ours, not bacteria, in molecular and cellular biology. It's the E. coli of complex cells. So in addition to celebrating Irish culture today, also raise a glass, because I know you'll have more than one, to this humble fungus well-deserving of our sincerest thanks. Slancha.
And real quick, I have to give a hearty recommendation to the song, a biologist St. Patrick's Day song. In addition to being a truly catchy drinking ditty, you'll also learn a lot about the chemistry of fermentation and what happens to your body when you drink. And here's a quick clip to get you excited about it. I will raise up a beer and I'll raise up a cheer for Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Yes, here's to brewer's yeast, that humblest of all beasts, producing carbon gas, reducing acetaldehyde. But my friends, that isn't all. It makes ethyl alcohol. Yes, that is what the yeast excretes, and that's what we imbibe. Oh, anaerobic isolation, alcoholic fermentation, NADH oxidation. Give me a beer. Lightly, I die, 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 brain barrier there's a girl in the next seat who i didn't think that sweet but after a few drinks i want to marry her i guess it's not surprising my dopamine is rising and my glutamate receptors are all shot well i'd surely be bemoaning all that extra serotonin but my judgment is impaired and my confidence is not whoa allosteric modulation no long-term potentiation hastens my inebriation you can find the entire song with lyrics and chords so you can learn to play it yourself on YouTube. So that'll do for our St. Patrick's Day celebration here on Organized Curiosity. Please favorite this station for more content like this coming up tomorrow. Maybe a little bit less alcohol theme, but no promises. And until next time, stay curious. There's a lot to learn. Welcome to Organized Curiosity, the anchor science station dedicated to bringing you everything we know about the natural world for your edutainment. I'm your host, Ryan Haupt, and it's time for the segment news you probably cannot use. Today in the news, we're talking about the congregation of humpback whales scientists have observed forming near South Africa. Now, these whales are being called supergroups, which means they have at least 20 individuals. The findings of the team, led by Ken Findlay, were published in PLOS One. PLOS stands for the Public Library of Science. And what that means is every article published in PLOS One is open access. And so you can actually go and read this specific scientific study if you're interested in all the nitty gritty beyond what I'm able to cover in my five minutes. So the title of the paper is Humpback Whale Supergroups a novel low-latitude feeding behavior of southern hemisphere humpback whales, Megoptera novangalia, in the Benguela upwelling system. Okay, so let's talk about why this is a weird thing to observe. It's weird for a couple of reasons. So humpback whales typically don't form large groups, and so that's why they're calling these groups supergroups of 20 or more individuals. They also have consistent migration patterns, which are being broken by seeing them in this part of the world at this time of the year. And they don't normally feed in this part of the ocean, which seems to be what they're doing in these supergroups that have been observed. So getting back to the migration a little bit, Humpback whales as a species have a global distribution, so you can find them in pretty much any of the world's oceans. But this doesn't mean that any one humpback is covering the entire ocean in their lifetime. Instead, populations of humpback whales have patterns of movement around the world's oceans. So that's why the title of this paper referred to these as Southern Hemisphere Humpbacks. What that means is they'll feed near the South Pole during the summer of the Southern Hemisphere when those waters are at their warmest and most productive. They'll then migrate north to warmer waters in the winter to give birth and raise their young. Normally, humpback whales don't feed when they're in the warmer waters. They instead rely on their energy reserves that they built up during the summer feeding season. What the scientists are observing here is this kind of groups of big humpback whales coming together to feed, at least we think they're feeding based on the behaviors we're seeing, it's kind of hard to measure that directly. And that's not what they're supposed to be doing in this part of the world at this time. But the researchers have seen it for a couple of years now. And so 
It's suggestive of a behavior that repeats in a predictable pattern. The authors of the paper suggest that this might not actually be a new behavior, but a result of a recent surge in humpback whale numbers. Humpback whales were once on the brink of extinction, and now they are this great story for conservation success, and they have actually in some cases been taken off of the endangered species list last year, some of which no longer need protections at all. Others have been downgraded just to being threatened, which is still not great, but so much better than critically endangered. So it could be that now that there are all these new whales in the ocean, that they just need more places to feed. And that could be an okay thing. You know, as long as all the whales that are out there are getting enough food, I mean, we know that the ocean should be able to support this many whales because there used to be that many whales. So it's possible that they're just exploiting a food resource that they need because their population numbers are up. It's also possible that... This is a natural behavior that we just weren't seeing because their numbers were so low once we started trying to actually observe them scientifically. So this could have been a strategy that is built into the whale's instincts or built into their, you know, passed down memory and culture. And I mean, culture is maybe a strong word, but it could just be this is a thing they know to do. We just never saw it because their numbers were so low when we weren't looking. It's also possible that, you know, these are smart animals and they're social and they can communicate. And so it's possible they've just figured out a new place to go and eat food. And we're just seeing them take advantage of that in real time, which is a pretty cool behavior to watch form organically in the moment if that is indeed what we're seeing. Whatever the reason, the fact that these behaviors are predictable means that we'll get to keep studying them. And so there's this great potential for future investigations of these Southern Hemisphere humpback whales and the feeding behaviors that they're either rediscovering or redoing now that we're observing or discovering for the first time. So there's way more science to be done to actually understand what's really going on here and that's always a great place to end on. Once you become adept at reading scientific literature, you'll notice that most studies end with three or four more new studies that could be done to follow up because we're always learning more and there's always more to be learned. And that's kind of the point of this station is we want you to learn as much about the natural world as we know. And then we want you to stay curious. And because as I end this segment every time, stay curious out there. There's a lot to learn. And now that same story you just listened to, but translated into whale for our cetacean listeners. I'm just kidding. It's just some whale songs. I thought it'd be appropriate after the previous segment. Enjoy. Welcome to Organized Curiosity. I'm your host, Ryan Haupt, and today I want to tackle a Q&A that I made up because I wanted to talk about it, and it's about chemical-free products. If you shop at stores that tend to have a lot of health food, organic type stuff, you might have recently seen an influx of products claiming to be chemical-free. Unfortunately, this is a nonsense term, and I want to dig into it a little bit, but I'm going to try really, really hard to be nice about it. So I'm going to tell you a story about myself that might inform you as to why I have a a particular bone to pick with this topic. When I first started college, I had moved from West Virginia to coastal California, which is a pretty big culture shift by any stretch. And this was in the early 2000s. So as far as I was aware, the beginnings of the organic food movement. And I remember going to the cafeteria one day and getting some food And then sitting down next to a, you know, casual acquaintance that I'd hoped to become friends with. And the guy looked at my tray and was like, is that organic? And 
having taken chemistry classes, but not having lived in California long enough to understand all the food terminology, I thought to myself, well, yes, it's organic matter made up of carbon molecules that I can eat and use. So of course it's organic. (laughs) And that's what I answered and then felt like a doofus because I didn't really know what it was. So maybe I'm just working on my issues, but hey, if I can work on my issues and you can learn something, then aren't we all winners? Okay, here's where the chemical free thing breaks down. Pretty much everything is chemicals. Like it's impossible to have a thing that's made of matter not be made of chemicals unless you were just eating like a bowl of pure protons or something like that. But pretty much everything we eat is in an atomic form of some way. (laughs) So everything, diamonds are chemicals, gold is chemicals, salt is a chemical, water is a chemical, you know, wine is a chemical, like everything you eat is a chemical. There's no way to avoid a thing being a chemical. Like it's just not a useful term. And I think this is where the gap between scientists and the general public breaks down because scientists have a very clear definition of what a chemical is. But it seems that the general public or at least certain sects within the general public that have certain feelings about food and health and and stuff like that have a different feeling of what a chemical is. And so for them, it's kind of like the next step in things being organic, where it just means that there's nothing artificial about it. But I still fail to understand what that distinction is. You know, what are you leaving out if it's not a chemical? Everything has to have chemicals. This also is kind of a problem I have with things being called all natural, because the connotation there is that all natural is good for you. And I like to point out to people that snake venom is all natural. But if you got bit by a snake, it probably wouldn't be considered all that healthy. I've also seen organic salt, which drives me crazy because salt is one of the few things we eat that's not organic. It's sodium chloride, NaCl. There's no carbon covalent bonds in there at all. So, you know, food is a tough thing to talk about as a scientist because scientists think that we have very clear and unambiguous definitions for what things mean. And then when it comes to culinary or or just food preferences, people have different feelings and that's fine, but it's hard to talk about when we're not all on the same page. So hopefully at least we're somewhat on the same page now, uh, even if we agree to disagree about what that page means. I'll end with reading the ingredients of an all natural banana as uh, made in an infographic by chemistry teacher from Australia, James Kennedy. Water, 75%. Sugars, 12%. That's 48% glucose. 40% fructose, 2% sucrose, and less than 1% maltose. Starch, 5%. Fiber, E460, 3%. Amino acids, less than 1%. Fatty acids, 1%. Colors and flavors. And within those, he has even more descriptions of exactly which kinds of acids, amino acids, fatty, and colors and flavors. There are things that would be very hard to pronounce. So uh, I'll just leave that as my kind of unstated exception to the, if you can't pronounce it, you shouldn't eat it. Criticism. Eat a banana. Let me know what you think about the terms chemical free, all natural, organic, all that stuff. Uh, Again, not passing judgment on whatever people choose to eat. I get that food is an incredibly personal choice that we all have to make every single day. So obviously you got to do what you think is best for you. I'm just arguing terminology because that's the kind of nerd I am. Maybe you're that kind of nerd too. If so, call in, let me know. Make sure you favorite this station so you can get angry or clap at the things that I say, depending on how you feel about the things that I'm saying. And be sure to come back next time because we're going to give you more science stuff like this as best we can every single day. Remember to stay curious out there. There's a lot to learn. Welcome to Organized Curiosity, the anchor science station dedicated to cataloging everything we know about the natural world for your edutainment. It's time for news you cannot use, guys. And you know why you can't use this news? Because it's a fossil octopus. So it's like, 
I don't already don't have many uses for octopus. And then if it's a fossil, it's probably even less useful. But it's interesting, and we're going to talk about it. In a paper titled Protero Octopus Rebetti in Colioid Evolution, first author Isabel Kruta and team used some new techniques to describe a kind of old fossil. So let's talk a little bit about why it's so difficult to find things like octopus, octopi, octopods, octopuses, whatever you want to call them, in the fossil record. There's this thing called taphonomy, and taphonomy is a branch of paleontology that studies the entire preservational history of an organism from the moment it dies to the moment it's found. So everything that happens in that interim is taphonomy. Within taphonomy, we understand that there are these things called preservation biases. So there are aspects of an organism in terms of ecology, habitat, anatomy, morphology, and just how long ago it died that all affect how likely it is to be preserved in the fossil record. So things that are big and have like hard parts, so like a giant turtle that live in environments that are gonna provide good fossilization, like a lake, are gonna preserve pretty well. That's because lakes are this low energy environment, so once the turtle dies, it's not likely to be tossed and turned in the waves or rolled down a river or fall down a mountain, and it's gonna get buried very gently and eventually preserved and then maybe exposed in the fossil record for paleontologists to find. On the other hand, if you have something that's really soft and squishy and lives up on the top of a mountain, like a mar Marmot. Okay, so marmots have bones, they have an internal skeleton, but they're also kind of just this big ball of fluff. And they also live in a place where there's not a lot of sediment being deposited. The sediment that is eroding from the mountains tends to roll downhill. So you have this really difficult environment for kind of a small, potentially sort of fragile critter to not get preserved very well. Then there's the time bias. Things that are very, 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 very old are less likely to last all the way up until the present as things that are relatively young. That's why we have things like frozen mammoths, but we don't have frozen T-Rex. Because the mammoths we find frozen died out 10,000 years or less ago, whereas T. rex was 65, 66 million years ago. So there's a huge difference there in the time scales. Octopus are cephalopods, which are a group of mollusks containing things like nautiloids, squid, and cuttlefish. The early fossil record for cephalopods is great because they had shells. So things like the chambered nautilus, which is still alive today, which has this really intricate and beautiful shell. There were things like ammonites, belemnites that also had really cool shells. And so we find them in the fossil record because they had these really nice hard parts. But the trend that was observed in cephalopod evolution is a general reduction in those hard parts over time. So cuttlefish have a cuttle bone, which you might buy from the pet store if you have a pet bird that needs to keep their beak sharp. Whereas squid only have a pin bone, which is a much smaller hard part than the cuttlefish. And then octopus have a beak. That's it. They don't have any other hard parts in their entire body. So that's why we talk about octopus being able to like squeeze through these really incredibly small spots that as long as the beak fits through, they can fit through. That's the only hard part that they can't constrict or morph or squish or otherwise manipulate. In the fossil record, that is really tough because soft parts decay. So it's very unlikely to get soft part preservation, except in the most exceptional preservational conditions. Because you also have to remember that like, if you die, things might scavenge and eat you. So, you know, it's not just about getting buried in the right sediment. It's about making sure that you're not getting eaten before you're successfully and gently buried to then later be found. So this fossil that the team looked at was actually found in 1982, and it's a 165 million year old fossil octopus from France. Uh, it was described originally with the name Protero Octopus Rebetti, and in order to describe a fossil, you have to describe the characteristics of the fossil, but this fossil was unfortunately smushed flat. So whatever had buried this octopus had also compressed it into almost a two-dimensional surface. And you can see photos of it if you search for the best fossil octopus online. It is a really impressive fossil. This new paper is really cool because what the team did is they used a technique called synchrotron microtomography, which was able to reconstruct some of the three-dimensional shape of the octopus. And from that reconstruction, they were able to describe new characteristics of that octopus that hadn't been described before. Thus, they were able to put it in a group of octopus known as Vampiropoda, which are like the vampire octopus that we see in the deep, deep ocean. So now we have a little bit more context for what this fossil is, where it comes from, and how it relates to modern octopus that we see in the ocean today. It's a really cool way to use new technology to better understand an older fossil. So kudos to the team for doing that. That'll do for the news today. Sorry that you can't use it, but hope you enjoyed it all the same. And thanks for listening to this station. Be sure to favorite it if you want more science content just like this every single day. Take care of us out there. There's a lot to learn.
Hey there, I totally love the show. I just want to say that a mathematical concept that I have been fascinated by forever and am really no closer to understanding, but I, I, I have hope, is um, Riemann surfaces. They're just awfully cool. Plink, plonk. A few days ago when I did Pi Day, I talked about the mathematical concept of pi, and I invited listeners to call in with their favorite mathematical concept, and I'm not a mathematician, so I probably should have seen this going wrong, and it, I mean, it didn't go wrong. Chris called in to say that he loves the show, which is wonderful. He also took up the opportunity, because I asked for it, to tell me about one of his favorite mathematical concepts. It's called a Riemann surface, and I can't explain what it is because it's all theoretical and abstract, and <laughs> I'm much better at science of things that I can, like, touch and look at. <laughs> um, so I did look it up. I tried to understand it. it. I looked it up on Wolfram Math World. So Wolfram and Wolfram Alpha are uh, great resources for people curious about various mathematical concepts. I would actually probably recommend them above Wikipedia. And I even asked a theoretical physicist friend of mine, Ben Tippett, who does the Titanium Physicist podcast, if you're looking for a physics podcast. And even he was like, I kind of vaguely remember what those are, but also never really understood them. I made it through most of the first sentence of the explanation on Wolfram, but even the first sentence kind of frustrated me because it says a Riemann surface is a surface-like configuration. I'm like, wait, you can't be... If you're called a surface, then how can you be like that? Are you not actually a surface? And I mean, clearly it's not actually a surface because it's a mathematical concept that can cover a complex plane with several and generally infinitely many sheets. But then sheets, the last word of the first sentence is in quotes. So we're not really talking about surfaces. We're not really talking about sheets. We're talking about equations and Lambert W functions and function fields and things like that. So... I can't really explain it. Uh, I can't tell you how it's spelled. It's R-I-E-M-A-N-N, because that maybe tripped people up. I definitely spelled it wrong the first time I tried to search for it. And they're very pretty to look at. So if you want to see s some pretty things with equations that you don't understand, or if you do understand, hey, that's that's how I end this. If you understand how these things work, what they are, what they're doing, and can explain it in terms that even a dumb paleontologist can understand, please call into the station and let us know. Uh, we would be thrilled. I think Chris and I, in particular, would be thrilled to hear what you have to say. So that'll do. This is the first... I'm calling this a QA and a segment because I like to call the call-ins that, but this Q is definitely not A'd. So if you have a Q you think I can A, please call in and let me know and favorite this station to make sure that you hear your answer when I answer it. Because so far I've tried to answer every question that comes in. This is just my first abject failure. So thanks again, Chris. Thanks for exposing my ignorance. If there's one thing scientists are really good at, it's saying when we don't know things. So I was actually kind of happy to have the opportunity to do that here. And until next time, stay curious out there. There's a lot to learn. The Paleo Pal is a segment of the show where we read feedback from the listeners give it back to you so you can kind of respond to it in a, in a recursive never ending cycle of all of us talking to each other about each other with each other. It's just, it's there for us all to have a good time. Not going to do a thesis this episode because uh, I'm alone. And it's a little hard to riff and improv by myself. I'm sure I could try. It may reach that point eventually. I'm hoping it won't for a little while though. So instead I have an email from Adam S who writes in to say, so glad y'all are still here. I love a good non-gendered plural you. Big fan. Message. I listened to every episode of Science Order when I was younger, around 2012, but I haven't listened in a long time. It popped into my head today, so I checked to see if you guys were still doing stuff, and I was so happy to see you still are. Cheers for a renewed listener after five years off. Hey, that's great. Uh, you know, there are definitely podcasts that I listen to sort of, I'll, I'll binge for a little while and then maybe take a break for months, if not longer, and then come back to it with a real renewed vigor. So 
totally makes sense that that would apply to our show as well. But Adam, we're super glad to have you back in the fold. Thanks for letting us know. Thanks for checking back in. That's really cool. Uh, I'm, I, it would be interesting to see like what the impression of us all was back in 2012 when you sort of tailed off listening and then how it sounded when you came back into it. Did you come back into it starting at the episode, like the next episode from 2012 that you didn't pick up on? Or did you start at the most recent episodes and start working your way back. I'm, I know we always joke about how fascinated we are by the ways in which people consume the content, but I think it's because podcasts are so personal and there's legitimately a lot of variety in the way people treat this medium. So, um, yeah, super psyched that you're back on board. Welcome back. Hope, hope you stick around. Hope you survive the experience as they say to rogue when she joins the X-Men. Um, that'll do for this episode. Anchors away part three. Hope you enjoyed it. I still have a fair bit of anchor content from my show, Organized Curiosity. So if you like this style of episode, um, I enjoy putting them together. I enjoy putting them out there. Uh, I'm proud of the content. So um, give me that feedback if you have it to be featured in a future Paleo Pow segment. Scienceorb.com is where you can get the show notes. Uh, these style episodes, the Anchors Away style, tend to have a lot of links because I try to include a link for each of the micro subjects, unless it's something I sort of wrote from whole cloth myself, which is uh, rarely the case, but did happen a few times. And um, Facebook, Twitter, great places to interact with us there. Do you want to see us on Instagram? Let us know. Don't really know what we would do with it, but that's that's always a possibility. Uh, I know all of our various hosts are great follows on those platforms as well, so be sure to check them out individually. I put all of our Twitter usernames in the about section for the at science sort of tag. So we're pretty easy to find that way. Uh, we've already got our recording set up for our next episode and I can tell you it's, we haven't recorded it yet, but it's going to be so much fun. I'm really looking forward to it. I think we're going to have a great time. Uh, we got a great guest who's going to drop some surprising, but, but I think uh, once you see where we go with it, it'll make sense why they're there dropping that knowledge. And yeah, thanks for tuning in. Looking forward to, to having you tune back in next time where you're going to get a whole lot more science. Sort of. Visit sciencesortof.com for show notes, links to all the stories we talked about, and ways to interact with the hosts, guests, and other listeners. Science Sort of is brought to you by the Brachialobe Media Network of Podcasts with audio engineering by Tim Dobbs of the Encyclopedia Brunch Podcast. That's all for this week. See you next time on Science Sort of. The audio you're about to hear was recorded in Anchor. Learn more at anchor.fm.